My dear and beloved people, I am pleased to announce the special re-release of the Emmy Award-winning documentary of the life of the late Archbishop Iakovos, entitled Iakovos, A Legacy. This inspiring film was produced in 1996 on the occasion of Archbishop Iakovos' retirement as Archbishop of the Greek Orthodox Archdiocese of North and South America, a position which he faithfully served for 37 consecutive years. I had the good opportunity to know Archbishop Iakovos for many years. He was a man who was deeply committed to the Orthodox faith and to the principles of human dignity, justice, and equality. He was a passionate promoter of Christian unity, and he strove for peace among persons of all races and religions. Today, as we remember the life of Archbishop Iakovos and his offering of leadership to our church and our nation, we recall once again his legacy of total faith in God and tireless devotion to humankind. I invite you to reflect upon the touching and courageous ministry of our beloved Archbishop Iakovos of blessed memory, which is beautifully presented in this documentary. May his noble soul rest in peace and may his memory be eternal. Unlike you and most of you, I was not born in the United States to live and enjoy democracy. I came to the United States from Turkey where I was a third category citizen. So when Martin Luther King Jr had his walk to the courthouse of Salem, Alabama. I decided to join him, so I said, this is my time to take revenge against all those who oppress people. Upon my return, someone called me Prodotti, traitor. Some other that I should be ashamed of what I have done. Some that I am not an American. Some that I'm not a Christian. I know that uh, civil rights and human rights continue to be the most thorny social issues in our nation. But I will stand for both rights, civil and human, for as long as I live. I feel the Christian duty and the duty of a man who was born as a slave. I remember a poem by uh, Wendell Holmes, which says, uh, in order to reach the ports of heaven, uh, we must sail, sometimes with the wind, and sometimes against the wind, but we must sail. Uh, and I said that uh, the Archbishop uh, has sailed with the wind many times uh, throughout his uh, episcopate, and sometimes he sailed against the wind. And we admired him most, actually, when he sailed against the wind. But he ha because he had the guts and the courage uh, to challenge many issues which no one else would dare challenge. Martin called on the religious leaders that he felt were respected throughout America. Uh, and uh, those who were respected and had great influence could influence others, and certainly Archbishop Yakovas was one of the most respected uh, throughout our nation and, uh, and certainly around the world. And if he participated, if he could submit himself to the dangers of the struggle, then this must be an important struggle. It elevated the struggle and certainly I think it showed the nobility of, uh, of the man as well. I think it's very hard for anyone not to see the picture in Life magazine and for Life to have put that front cover 
and have shown it around the world that not to have been moved to say if he could commit himself, they would have to come there too. I think it would be hard for any clergy. It doesn't really matter what, which, which denomination, what country you're in, I think it would be very hard for you to sit and at the same time say so you're the same brotherhood as the eminence. And he came and put himself on the line. And what, I, what we have to remember is that people were dying there. At the time, he was threatened, the hotel he was living in, they threatened to burn it down that night, and that uh, they even threatened to shoot him if he would march. And the answer was that, let's march. Where do we start marching? Archbishop Iakovos, a champion of human and civil rights in America and the world. For 37 years, the head of the Greek Orthodox Church in America and a tireless champion of Christian and Hellenic ideals. Today, he is the Dean of Religious Leaders in the Western Hemisphere. His highly visible stance that day in Selma, Alabama, catapulted the Orthodox Church to the forefront of American consciousness. He has always been a steadfast voice against oppression all over the world, an oppression he had witnessed as a child in his native island of Imfros and as a teenager in Constantinople, present-day Istanbul. It is a fight he continues today speaking out against the repression of the ecumenical patriarchate, the center of worldwide orthodoxy. A fight against the division and occupation of the island of Cyprus by the Turks. We are gathered here to demonstrate our faith in God and the noble nature of man, to further demonstrate our unity and strength in pursuing the goals of justice, liberty, and peace here in Cyprus and everywhere. Well, the Archbishop took a, a very strong position and commanding lead after the brutal invasion of Cyprus in the summer of 1974. The important thing was, though, that the Archbishop's action in, in that matter reflected an already established position with respect to human rights as a champion of human rights. I mean, the Archbishop marched with Martin Luther King and Selma, and he had spoken out frequently on important human rights issues around the world, so that when he spoke on Cyprus, it was, a, it was a further reflection of his deep concern for human rights. But of course, he was a champion in, in that cause and has continued to be, just as he was in assuring that the uh, ecumenical patriarchate would be able to, to function as a religious institution uh, despite the oppression of the, of the Turkish government. When the patriarchate in uh, Istanbul, or Constantinople, as he always uh, called it, was in danger of being destroyed, and he talked to me privately, and I decided to go to uh, Turkey. And I met with the president, I met with the prime minister, <clears throat> I met with the patriarch, and eventually we worked out a, a reasonable solution to that uh, very difficult problem. But it was because of, of him and his ability to communicate <clears throat> and to share things that, that made it possible for me to go on this mission. Later, of course, he was invited to visit uh, not only the Patriarchate, but other places in Turkey. I think this shows the respect even of, uh, of a Muslim uh, society to have confidence in him. So I think in many ways his contributions are almost indescribable. He was very de decisive. I, I, I particularly remember going to see him during the crisis on EMEA. And there were many leaders in the Greek community there, and he was talking to us. And, and I asked him if he thought it would be a good idea to form a Hellenic caucus in Congress so that we could more swiftly respond to the problems that Greece and Cyprus and the Hellenic community continually face. And he didn't wait for a second. He said, I will be eternally grateful, and I bless you in this endeavor. Go and do it. And I left, and I was, and I did. I left, and I went and did it. But what struck me about him was his decisiveness, a wonderful religious leader. But at the same time, he was a uh, very astute and intelligent and insightful political leader. He had a tremendous understanding of the problems confronting 
uh, Greece and Cyprus, and he had strategies and directions and inspiration. Democracy and freedom must be continued and perpetuated until the end of time. Thank you very much. Well, in an age when uh, we need moral leadership and need leadership uh, for uh, human rights and justice and peace, he's going to be strongly missed uh, uh, in his active role, uh, a role in which he has um, reached out in so many areas. Uh, we hope and pray that even with his retirement, he'll still be an activist uh, because he will be sorely needed uh, in so many areas that we're all concerned about human rights, justice, and peace. We wish him well in his retirement. We wish him good health. But more importantly, we wish that he will not be too far away from these important issues. Archbishop Iakovos began his life as Dimitrios Kukuzis in 1911 on the tiny Aegean island of Imvros. He was one of four children born to Maria and Athanasios Kukuzis. Young Dimitrios's life was changed radically when, in 1923, the Turks took over the island after the Treaty of Lausanne. Within the confines of life on the occupied island, young Dimitrios excelled as a student. He demonstrated an exceptional intelligence and a religious maturity well beyond his years. In 1927, at the age of 16, he was awarded a scholarship to study at the Theological Seminary of Halki in Constantinople. Dimitrios was a serious, disciplined student, respected and admired by his peers. After completing his studies at the age of 23, he experienced a period of uncertainty, questioning how he could best serve God. At that time, he was serving as a lay preacher back in Imvros. I was called to the police station after one of my sermons and the accusation was leveled against me that they was preaching against the Turks. So from that day it was in September until uh, the mid of November, I didn't know what to do. I didn't like to be a burden to my parents. I was for seven years while I was studying in Halki. I was very sensitive to that aspect of filial love. So one evening while I was still thinking what to do, I saw in my dream Christ. And I tried to withdraw from his side and to hide myself behind a walnut, a big walnut tree along the way where I was walking. Then at a certain moment I decided to come out from my hiding place. And I saw his finger. That I interpreted as his calling. Soon afterwards, Dimitrios Kukuzis was ordained a deacon and given the name Iakovos. He began his career under the guidance of Metropolitan Ioachim, his former dean at the theological school of Halki. During that time, his faith was tested and ridiculed, yet he emerged stronger in his beliefs. With the hope to further his education in the United States, Deacon Iakovos addressed himself to the then Archbishop Athenagoras, who invited him to serve as his archdeacon in 1939. Iakovos was ordained a priest in 1940 and was assigned to the parish of St. George in Hartford, Connecticut. He later served as a preacher in the Holy Trinity Cathedral in New York City and as an instructor and then assistant dean of the Theological Seminary in Pomfret, Connecticut, under Bishop Cavadas of Boston. After serving the parish of St. Nicholas in St. Louis, Missouri, he was assigned by Archbishop Athenagoras as the Dean of the Annunciation Cathedral in Boston. He remained there as a dominant spiritual force for the next 12 years. I guess I must have been about 10 when he first came to the Greek cathedral here. And he was obviously a very different guy. I mean, he was young, he was dynamic, uh, loved kids. Um, he became a great Red Sox fan and still, by the way, remains a Red Sox fan. I remember asking him once how he felt when that ball went through Buckner's legs in the famous game in the 1986 World Series. He said, Michael, I wept tears. And I'm sure he did. 
used to take us to the ball game. I mean, he was a modern priest in a very interesting way, uh, a guy who, um, who saw his role as being uh, very much a counselor and, uh, and a mentor to young people. I worked very closely with him in um, rejuvenating uh, the Sunday school. And uh, we started having, um, bringing the three-year-olds, which was a beginning and the first time that I think that a church that started to bring the younger children is part of our Sunday school curriculum. And he used to have uh, a pedicia colothia in the baptistry on Sunday for the ages three to six. And it was the most moving and uplifting at least for me and all the Sunday school teachers that were part of that group, um, to hear him as he talked to the little children at that age and to hear their responses to him, which really set him up for his liturgy and for going on into the service of our church. We did quite a few songs for the young people, for the little ones, the little ones particularly, and one song stands out uh, the one about the Rio Mataque a Ejogo. And uh, I think if we meet sometimes, we start singing that song together, even now. You know, he remembers how well that went over with the children. And that was a song that had um, hand motions with it. You know, the children would say Rio Mataque and then Rio Aftake and whatever, Rio Queraque. And it was really a lovely, lovely little song for little children. Now, we had young adults as part of the Sunday school, uh, 18 and 19 and 20 year olds. And uh, they used to skip out of the Sunday school classes. And lo and behold, as, our, as I still uh, feel and um, call him my dear Pate, and most of the Bostonians still do that, that he, with his black robes, would run down Huntington Avenue to Howard Johnson's and bring the young people back to the Sunday school and to the church. While in Boston, Father Niakovos, the ever-eager student, studied at Harvard Divinity School, where he obtained a master's degree in 1945. His tenure in Hartford, New York City, St. Louis, and Boston familiarized him with the American mentality and attitude, and certain realities unique to the Orthodox Church in the New World. A liturgy with organ music, church halls with social activities, and a modern administration were eye-openers for Father Yakovos. On the other hand, the Greek Orthodox Church was distinctly parochial in the midst of a very diverse society. Father Yakovos had been educated and trained at a time when the Patriarchate was the leader in the ecumenical movement and called for cooperation of Christian churches in social, political, and moral issues. He applied these beliefs on a parish level. He learned to love and appreciate the diversity inherent to America. He speaks a universal language, not only to his co-religionists, but to people of all different religions and people who really seek his advice on matters of uh, human rights, personal conflicts that they have. He has a very, very um, deep insight into human nature. And the thing that uh, I really feel most comfortable with him when I talk to him and seek his advice is at the core, he's still a priest. He's a person ministering to people and trying to help them. And when you begin discussing problems with him, uh, you can see that. You can see that uh, his many years as a priest before he became a bishop and archbishop are still very much a part of him. July 4th of 1990 was the uh, date of my spinal cord injury. I uh, dove into a pool and fractured my C5 vertebrae. Essentially, I broke my neck and was rendered paralyzed from uh, my shoulders down. Uh, the Archbishop came to see me uh, relatively soon after the injury happened. Um, saw me in the hospital, uh, gave me a tremendous amount of confidence, uh, was there really to comfort me. Um, stood next to me, held my hand, talked with me. Uh, uh, it's, it gave me a level of comfort uh, that's just it's difficult to describe. We saw him as uh, our pastor, as someone who touched us uh, because he gave us the faith and 
and, and the spiritual strength to get through this very difficult time. All of his advice, all of his, uh, all of his words and his action were to um, enhance our belief that we would, uh, this would pass, that we, would, we could handle it, that, that Nick would be all right, that we would be all right. He instilled in me that invincibility is, is in the mind and I could do anything that I wanted um, if I just remained strong and focused. And uh, when he came to see me, it was, uh, I really realized how blessed I was. Um, I started counting my blessings. It was a terrible thing, the injury, but so much good has come out of it and he helped put that into perspective for me. You know, you're filled with doubt at a time like that. You question many things and his phone calls and his visit and his letters and I know he was praying for us when he wasn't with us all gave us that that strength in our own belief that we could make it and it, it hasn't stopped and I don't think we're unique I don't think he's just touched us he touches everybody that way everybody I have the, uh, the pleasure of serving in the altar as an altar boy and uh, just seeing him in the altar and actually I was surprised how pious the man is um, and watching him eagerly and, and uh, unceasingly pray uh, was an inspiration for me. On Holy Thursday, he does for the staff a uh, service in the afternoon, and he has the procession with the cross. And as you watch him carry that cross, even now at 84 years old, he insists on carrying the cross around the chapel. And as you watch him crying and with emotion carrying the cross, I always say that even those with the least faith have to have their faith strengthened. If you watch him after the service, he comes up to his office, closes his door, remains by himself silently, and when you open the door, you find him crying every year, Holy Thursday, Holy Friday. I see him as a liturgist par excellence. I see him as one who prays the liturgy. And he has a way of inspiring those who are participants in the liturgy to pray with him. That is a significant contribution for a priest to make. Oh, we're all going to miss so much. You know, for me personally, I think of uh, what a great liturgist he was. And it, I had the privilege from when I was a little boy to be able to watch him uh, officiate at ceremonies in our church and to consecrate the Church of Our Savior in Rye, New York, and to serve at the cathedral in New York, and I'll never forget that. But beyond that, he also served as a moral example and a real leader, a man who led by example, a man who led with his words and his vision and his strength of character. And I think that uh, that is going to be missed by the entire American community and by the Greek American community. Of course, we all hope and know that whoever succeeds the Archbishop will strive to live up to the example he set, but we're going to miss him deeply. With the departure of Bishop Gavales from America, Father Jacobus served briefly as Dean of the Seminary until he was elected Bishop of Melita in December 1954. After a brief visit to his native island of Imfros, where he received the blessing of his mother, Bishop Jacobus was sent to Geneva, Switzerland to serve as the official delegate and representative of the Ecumenical Patriarch to the World Council of Churches. Patriarch Athenagoras, showing his appreciation for the ecumenical ministry of Iakovos, elevated him in 1956 to the rank of Metropolitan. Three years later, Metropolitan Iakovos was elected as one of the six presidents of the World Council of Churches, an office he held for 10 years. In 1959, Metropolitan Iakovos returned to the country he had come to know and love intimately. He was elected Archbishop of North and South America to lead his flock through a time of historic changes for the church 
and American society as well. I'm Larry King, and it's a great pleasure to have as our special guest this weekend, one of the world's distinguished religious leaders. He is Archbishop Yakovos of the Greek Orthodox Church. He is primate of the Greek Orthodox Church of North and South America, and one of the presidents of the World Council of Churches, and a member of the Ecumenical Conference. Would you tell me, Your Eminence, what we mean by primate of the Church of North and South America? We mean the man who is primarily responsible for the spiritual and moral welfare of the Greek Orthodox faithful in North and South America. Is this post obtained by appointment, election, how? Uh, I would say by both, because uh, the Archbishop must be selected by the Patriarch of Constantinople and then elected by the Synod. His first missions were to unite the Greek Orthodox community into one ecclesiastical entity and to bring the Orthodox people of other ethnic origins together into one body. I think the one outstanding achievement in terms of maintaining the unity, which was started really under the late Archbishop Athenagoras, later Patriarch of Constantinople, in unifying our Greek Orthodox communities and our faithful here, is that he's maintained that unity, and it wasn't an easy thing to do under many, many difficult circumstances, not only maintaining it, but increasing it and developing it and letting it grow in such a way that we are now a major faith in the United States. He was a pioneer in the establishment of the Standing Conference of Orthodox Bishops back in the early 60s. Uh, his dream is to unify under the uh, ecumenical patriarchate all of the Orthodox jurisdictions in this country. Uh, he was the chairman of the Ligonier meeting, the first Ligonier meeting, where all of the hierarchs got together and dreamed about the future and, and, and shared their faith and, and, uh, and hope for the future. And I hope that uh, one day when that comes, everyone will remember that it was Archbishop Yakovus that, that had the, um, the tolmi, the, he was brave enough to, and the vision to bring about that unity. The Archbishop is a bridge builder. Um, throughout the years, we have had our share of uh, differences among uh, various Orthodox jurisdictions. So the Archbishop, as chairman of SCOBA, was always there to um, overcome these differences and uh, to bring peace to the, uh, to the standing conference of uh, canonical Orthodox bishops. Uh, he was um, very mindful uh, of the destiny of orthodoxy uh, in this country. His greatness lies in the fact that he was able to combine the culture of the old world with the culture of the new world. He was able to remain faithful to the ecumenical throne uh, while uh, not losing his visions for orthodoxy uh, on this continent. Uh, the Bible says, without visions, the people will perish. And the Archbishop has been a very, very visionary leader in this country. One of the Archbishop's first assignments was to visit Pope John XXIII at the Vatican in 1959. Acting as the Patriarch's personal emissary, Archbishop Jacobus heralded a new era in interreligious relations as the first Orthodox leader to meet with a Pope in over 300 years. The doors were closed. The walls were reaching heaven. Any hope of unity was non-existent at that time. But that great man, John XXIII, opened my eyes and I saw new avenues of which I never imagined they were existing. The avenue of going to one another, of approaching one another, of praying together. Later, in 1964, he attended the historic meeting between Patriarch Athenagoras and Pope Paul VI in Jerusalem. 
and the ceremonies in Rome which annulled the mutual excommunications between the Roman Catholic and the Eastern Orthodox Church. And they may all be one, as you, Father, are in me, and I am in you. May they also be in us, so that the world may believe that you have sent me. The glory that you have given me... The ecumenical movement would be much the poorer had Archbishop Yakovus not walked this way. Not only the National Council of Churches, but the World Council of Churches. He was a president of the World Council. He was and has been a leader in the National Council of Churches since its founding. I would say that the greatest contribution he has made is the constancy of his leadership. You never had to wonder where the Archbishop was. He was always going to be in the same place, and he was always going to be faithful, and he was always going to call the churches to the deepest possible commitment to unity. His commitment to unity is rooted in his understanding of the Trinity, and it is no less than being able to say, as Father, Son, and Holy Spirit are one, so we must be one. And I have heard him say that with passion and fervor and excitement. And if ever the other churches begin to be a little frivolous about unity, he will always call them back to the central meaning of unity for the faith. And we need that voice. We've always needed that voice. There have been a few people on the American religious scene. Uh, Archbishop Yakovos is one. Rabbi Abraham Joshua Heschel was another that, as a reporter, you had a little bit of a feeling that you were approaching rather like God. And uh, so it, it takes a while, in a way, to also recognize that behind this forceful personality is a kind of teasing sense of humor. Uh, only after I had talked to him and interviewed him several times did that come clear to me. His Eminence one, one afternoon decided to take a walk through Central Park with his deacon. And as he was walking through Central Park, he always goes with his blue undiddy cassock and his cross. And he was walking through Central Park, and this little black child came running up to him, a little, little thing. He wasn't more than three years old. And he said, Mama, Mama, it's Jesus, it's Jesus. And the archbishop went over, embraced the little boy, and he said, No, my son, I'm not Jesus. I just work for him. I remember so many times when he would be over at our house, on a weekend evening, let's say, uh, we would uh, sit in the living room and he'd put me on his lap and we would just talk. He would tell me some stories. He'd ask me, you know, how I'm doing in school. And I had a little uh, puppy dog at the time. It was a little miniature greyhound. And his name was Snoopy. And uh, you know, I was kind of uh, curious just to see how he would react to a dog in the house, you know. He, there's this man who, as a child, you don't understand him as a leader of this church, but he, you know, is still a, an awesome figure in your home. And he loved the dog. He used to, he used to let the dog jump up on him, and, and he would play with him and pet him. And I just thought that was the neatest thing, to see this uh, man of, with such power, you know, coming down to such a level to play with me and my dog. It was really, it was really a lot of fun for me as a child. The Archbishop's greatest love is people. He loves to be around people. And I, I think what he truly hated was office work. Put him with people to preach, to teach, to be around his people, that gave him the greatest joy in the world. Other things that uh, uh, gladdened his heart was gardening. I remember on Martha's Vineyard in the summertime, he would go after uh, gardening like uh, you wouldn't believe. Uh, he loves to cook, and he prides himself, as a matter of fact, on being a very good cook, uh, swordfish especially, makes the best cup of coffee I ever had. Well, most people would find it hard to believe that His Eminence is a world-class Scrabble player. Incredible. The words that he comes up with sometimes, and I'm born in this country, I say, that's not a word. And sure enough, when I look it up in the dictionary and I challenge him, I end up losing a turn because uh, often, more often than not, it is. Again, he was asked, Your Eminence, how would you like to be remembered by society in the Omoyenya? And his answer was something that shocked me. He said, as a regular guy. And I thought to myself, this is far from a regular guy. And he said, when I was a priest in St. Louis, he said, 
I happened to walk in on a group of young people, and I heard them talking about me. And they were saying, he's wonderful. He's one of us. He's a regular guy. Now, he may want to be remembered as a regular guy, but in my eyes, he'll be remembered as a giant in the church, a giant in orthodoxy, but a man who never forgot his roots. I think that Archbishop Jacobus's legacy is just beginning and that further on down the road when our children and grandchildren are really involved in our church, that's when we will uh, see Archbishop Jacobus's legacy and we will re reap the fruits of what he has done for us these 37 years. In New York's Greek Orthodox Cathedral of the Holy Trinity, the six-month-old Cajurus quadruplets are christened in ancient and colorful rites, residing primate of the Orthodox Church in North and South America. In America, Archbishop Yakovos found the land he had envisioned from his enslaved home in Imvos, a land where orthodoxy could grow unhindered in a nation that would safeguard the freedom to worship. In this land, Archbishop Jacobus took the dreams of his predecessors and nurtured them into reality. During his tenure, the Greek Orthodox Archdiocese of North and South America grew in stature and number of parishes. The Archbishop realized that a forward-looking church could only survive with the aid of ancillary organizations that would expand and project the church's mission in the new world. His primary focus was the field of education, where his major priorities included the establishment of Hellenic College as a sister institution to the Holy Cross School of Theology in Brookline, and the reorganization of the Greek language schools in America in order to address the needs of second and third generation Greek American children. He is the one that gave impetus to the creation of Hellenic College as we know it for it to become a center for Greek studies, a center whereby we can and can continuously promote and inculcate into the hearts not only of our students but of the faithful in general a deep appreciation for our cultural heritage. The Archbishop has always shown a special interest in the continuing and expanding operation of two institutions established by his predecessors. Two institutions of essential philanthropic activity. St. Basil's Academy, which provides a home and an education to orphans and children from troubled homes, and St. Michael's Home for the Aged. When I'm traveling with His Eminence, um, it get, becomes very easy to get caught in the pomp and circumstance. But there are th really three areas and three places of, of the, our archdiocese where he feels most at home. Uh, first, St. Basil's Academy. He loves going there, visiting the grounds, uh, meeting with the children, talking with the children, playing with the children, whether it be baseball or some other games. Uh, then St. Michael's, when we go every year, we go about twice a year. And he enjoys singing the old songs with the, uh, with the people of the, of the home and liturgizing with them and sharing stories and experiences that they've both had growing up together with the church here in America. But I think the place that he really calls his home is at the Holy Cross. There he looks at the, the students and the seminarians that are studying to the priesthood and there he really envisions the future of our church. And it's a place where he feels most comfortable and most peaceful. And it's appropriate as well that there's the place that they're gonna build the Archbishop Yakovos Library and Resource Center because that's where he feels at home and that's where he belongs. By breaking the ground for the new library, I wonder what I should plant in that ground. And I plant your visions and mine, your dreams and mine, your hopes and mine, your future, and the 
future of your children and grandchildren. Of great significance to the continued work of the archdiocese have been the initiation of the League of Greek Orthodox Stewards, or Logos, and the establishment of the Leadership 100 Endowment Fund. Both programs guarantee financial stability, allowing the archdiocese to fund essential aspects of its mission. Do we offer the hope of the church of today? It was the dream of his eminence that in this great country of ours we would find men and women who would be willing to go ahead and give to support the church for an endowment that would preserve the future of our church. That was a high point in the time as far as the church is concerned because we believe we tried other methods of raising funds. None of them produced any funds. We paid people to raise money and they, we paid them more than they collected. And at that time we decided that if we wanted to raise anything for the Archdiocese, we must do it within our own people. Under the guidance of Archbishop Jacobos, Several organizations affiliated with the Archdiocese have flourished and exceeded their original goals. The Young Adult League expanded the scope of the Greek Orthodox Youth of America, established by Archbishop Michael. If love is translated into solidarity, into compassion, into charity, into caring, then these uh, problems may be answered. Today, YAL and Goya help Greek Orthodox children and young adults to learn and live their Orthodox faith. In 1969, the Archdiocese launched the Ionian Village, a summer camp on the coast of the Peloponnese. One of the Archdiocese's most effective and popular programs it brings young Greek Americans closer to Greece and their ethnic heritage. The Philothopos Lady Society for the Poor was organized by Archbishop Athenagoras to combat the misery of the Great Depression. Today, the society has chapters in every parish and serves as the major philanthropic arm of the archdiocese. His uh, eminence, Archbishop Athenagoras, had this vision uh, for a role for the ladies in the church. And he took this little tiny seed and planted it. Then Archbishop Jacobus came along and nurtured the seed, and it became a beautiful tree, which is now the Philoptychus. And I, I think he has inspired us. He has challenged us always always to do better, to be better than what we are, and to reach out and do great things. And I think that through the years, this is what we have done. If I were just to say what I will miss, it is his warmth, uh, his propensity for friendship. Uh, I'm not even a, a, a Greek Orthodox, and yet he's been my friend, in a sense a counselor. And, and, and I'll, I'll, I think that will be missed by the, by the community. Uh, I love the guy. I really love him. Upon thy faithful servant, our beloved President John Fitzgerald Kennedy, save thy people, O Lord, and bless thine territory. I think the tendency among Greek Americans is to become inwardly focused. And when we first came to this country, that was a natural and unnecessary thing for us to do. But now we've all be moved on from our, our first generations and we've become more successful. It's time to serve the country and the Archbishop has been real instrumental in turning our focus outward to social service, not just to the Greek Americans or to just to Greece, including them, but going beyond that to our communities, not just the Orthodox. Well, as the leader of the Greek American community for the last generation, he really led the way in the Greek American community's assimilation 
into American society without losing its special identity, its religious identity, its cultural identity. And I think that, that being able to do that and being able to balance the need to assimilate and the need to stay true to our values and our heritage and our faith was a very tough job in the modern world, but he did it in an unparalleled way. Archbishop Yakovus, with his faith, uh, set an example that politicians, be they, be they orthodox or whatever, could adhere to uh, and could, could respect. So he never tried, in my view, or at least when I was president, to impose certain religious constraints or religious beliefs uh, on the country through the president. He never tried that. What he was, though, was an example, uh, a stalwart example, uh, for the faith he believed in without trying to impose it on others. Following in the steps of his predecessors, Archbishop Yakovos pursued the recognition of the Orthodox Church as one of the major faiths by the federal and state governments, the House and the Senate, and the armed forces. I recall years back when I was in the service, and they had to uh, present you with dog tags. I indicated to the person in charge, I'm Greek Orthodox. He just looked at me and would say, what is that? I said, Greek Orthodox. He says, well, we'll stamp uh, Protestant. I said, no, you're not going to stamp anything. Either you stamp G-O or you don't stamp any faith. That is my faith. That's not the case today. We have become one of the most major faiths of the United States, despite the number that we have here in the United States, which I think may average maybe not quite two million, and it's because of his eminence. I remember when I lost a governor in my first try for re-election, and it was a very, very disappointing defeat. I mean, I was 40 points ahead in the polls, and everybody thought I was going to be an easy winner, and I was defeated in a surprising upset. And it was very disappointing. And I'll tell you quite frankly that uh, I doubted very much that I would ever go back into elective politics again. I mean, I thought I'd been beaten and that was the end of it. And he was one of the first people to come to me and say, look, you've got to run and run and run again. You can't let this defeat you. You've got a lot to offer. So you've been set back. I want to see you run again. And let me tell you, at a time when Mike Dukakis was hurting, those were very important words. Uh, so in a very personal sense, his understanding of the importance of public service and of young Greek Americans getting into public service and staying in public service and competing in public service was very important to me. Since 1931, Greek Orthodoxy in the Americas has been inspired by the leadership of three great men who guided the church in three different eras. Archbishop Athena Goras, a gifted diplomat and administrator, took the church from the ashes of political division and ecclesiastical schism and reconstructed it into a forward-looking church based on orthodox canons and traditions, as well as American social reality. Archbishop Michael, an intellectual and mystic, presided over the consolidation of the church in the American social fabric and placed great emphasis on piety, discipline, and sacramental life. Archbishop Jacobus, who grew and matured from the ranks of the American clergy, led the Greek Orthodox Church and the Greek American community through their age of maturity. He guided church and community to assume their rightful place in this land. He renewed the church and strengthened its foundations. He reminded other faiths of the church's rich spirituality and tradition. He was a champion of the victims of hunger, poverty, war, and discrimination. He took an adolescent church and nurtured it to adulthood. He made orthodoxy vibrant and visible in American society. And this country and its people took notice. He has given guidance to millions. He was a kind of uh, man who felt at ease uh, working side by side with uh, Martin Luther King, Jr. And as a Greek Orthodox leader, he was at ease going to visit the Roman Catholic Pope. Uh, he felt at ease 
uh, communicating with me as President of the United States. And uh, he did this because the principles on which his life was founded were totally compatible with the principles of his own religious faith. He, he applied his faith in practical terms. And, and this is fairly rare, not only for in the secular world, but also among religious leaders. How do you equate the idealism, uh, the dreams, the element of uh, simplicity, of humility, of compassion, of service, of uh, agape love, to a, a life in the hurly-burly of a modern-day uh, technological society? He was able to do this, I think, in a transcendent way. So I was the one honored, I, I felt, when he received the uh, Presidential Medal of Freedom. It was not only a, an award for me, but it was an award for the people of this country. I'm going to miss you, but you've earned a good retirement because you've led our community and our country for a very long time, for longer than I've been born, and we're all indebted to you for that service and that leadership. I envision him coming and to teach at the school and that I would like to see him to continue writing and putting down and that I would like, hopefully, that he would continue in some way to spreading orthodoxy and lifting it up throughout the world. I would ask him to work on his memoirs and to leave us a book or books uh, where he opens his heart and writes his many experiences. Here's a man that has met the top leaders of the world. Uh, he's traveled the length and breadth, not only of this hemisphere, but the entire world. And just to share with us those experiences, ex share with us what it means to be a leader and a bishop. It's always... Uh with a bit of sadness that someone removes themselves from the scene, but I hope that his voice will still be heard and certainly his spirit will be there to uh, guide us. We will miss his presence probably uh, more than anything, but his commitment and his courage and the inspiration that he gave will still continue. I have been blessed to be your friend, to have you as my spiritual father. And my life has been enriched that our paths have crossed and embraced. As president, I want to thank you. Uh, and as a Christian, I want to thank you. Because you've not only been an inspiration for those who have a Greek Orthodox faith, but those of us Christians who have many other denominations but serve the same Savior and the same God. And uh, I'm grateful for what you've done for my country, what you've contributed to the world, and, and in particular what you've contributed to me as an inspiration. Don't put that staff down. Continue with your work. Continue with your vision, your inspiration, your intelligence, your love, your humanity. Don't put that staff down. Keep working for human rights. Keep, keep working with us. Keep helping us. And uh, don't ever stop. I'd say, well done. I'd say, well done, sir. You served your church with great honor. Uh, you served the Greek American community with great honor. Uh, and you're my friend. And I salute you. And I thank you for that friendship. My brother, I wish you well. I wish you peace and tranquility in your uh, retirement years. And I don't want you to regret anything. Because whatever you have done in your most fruitful ministry, you have done it not for the glory of, not for the glory of Jacobus, but for the glory of God. So uh, may your retirement years be full of joy and spiritual satisfaction. Well done, thou good and faithful servant.
I don't think that any other human being was so richly blessed by God as I. I was a small village boy, and now I stand before you all white, aged, and I leave this great continent whose people the world of faith were entrusted to me. I leave it to you. Continue to uphold the standards of the faith and Hellenism and culture and history through your own children and grandchildren. It's a great heritage, the greatest mission. And believe me, I thank God for I have faith in you. You will never fail God, history, and my prayers. Thank you so much.